Hi, welcome to the video lecture series of real-time operating systems. I'm Professor Balamurgan from the IIT University Chennai campus and I'm going to walk through what is real-time operating systems starting from what is operating system, general purpose operating system, history of it, a bit of it actually and I'll go through the essentials of real-time operating systems starting from kernel board support packages what are the time critical activities that we have to cover in real-time operating systems the basic of what is an operating system is essential services provided by the kernel understanding the hardware resources available in interacting with the processes processes I mean here Intel ARM in the market and Operating system is basically set of services provided by the kernel to the users. Also, it manages the memory like hard disk, RAM and other I.O. devices like keyboard, display, Wi-Fi, routers, etc. Et and you can see a brief uh, layer stacked over here. The bottom layer indicates that the hardware the essentially where the OS is going to run. It might be Linux, it might be Windows, it might be Android that's coming up in heavily. On top of it is the real uh, operating system which interacts with the user through the application and works on the hardware level. The same operating system layers in different perspective of what is the end user going to apply over here and what is the concerns of the programmer, what is the operating system designer, where is these people really going to work in each of the layers. Now let's go through a bit of history about what are the various modes of operation that we have in an operating system starting with batch mode of operating system where each of the processes are punched into a batch of process and next we have multi programming systems where each of the program can be running parallelly concurrently in the system but not interacting with it and the next is the multitasking system where each of the programs can interact within itself and finally where we have real time systems where the essential feature is the time each of the task is time critical system process over here and what are the operating system functions provided in general this is not specific to real time operating system in general process management like when we boot our operating system and we get into the start uh, mode of the windows for example we have various process available. You can press Al, Control, Delete, and you see Humpty number of process loaded into the system. So these are the process managed by the kernel and memory management. This indicates that the hard disk, the RAM, any other extra peripheral connecting into the system has to be managed by the kernel and where is this particular kernel is going to run and what are the various parts of memory it has to control for input and output processing all these are managed over here including the file systems and there comes the secondary storage management and also IO system management is basically we have USB keyboards USB mouse display as I'm pointing out Wi-Fi routers, uh, headphones, microphones, speakers, printers, all these are basically IOs connecting as a peripheral device coming into the processor right now. Again, these are again managed by the OS. And finally, file management. As I'm pointing out, file systems is primary. In Windows, we call it as NTFS file system. In Linux, we go with uh, ext file system, ext2, ext3, ext4, various file systems available. These are again managed by the operating systems kernel. 
let's walk through a basic architecture of index operating system you can see the gray area where that's the real hardware where uh, our operating system is going to run and the next is the blue where the kernel that we are going to write as an operating system is going to run over there on top of the hardware and the next shell is the environment where the user is provided as an access to interact with the system i mean through the kernel the hardware so the user interacts with the hardware or using the shell making use of the facilities of the kernel and finally the brown indicates the users okay so for example the applications that's going to run here i, I call it as matlab is an application that's provided and uh, kyle is an application vlc media player is an application internet explorer is an application chrome is an application so whatever the applications apps today we call it as that's going to work parallelly with the shell so the user interacts using the shell through the kernel the hardware the application on the other side acts directly with the kernel interacting with the hardware okay so let's come to the primary aspect of this lecture what is real time operating system the definition indicates from different uh, fields here a variant of an os that operates in constrained environment in which computer memory and processing power is limited let's take a traditional example of nokia mobile uh, 1100 how many people many people should be aware of this mobile very very powerful thing in those days we never had android we never had blackberry is the only uh, smartphone that was available uh, in 2000 to 2005 way back then we are not very much proficient with uh, any of the android or windows or uh, the other linux based uh, kernels running on a hardware it's the real time operating system that's actually i would even call it as an embedded operating system because in mobiles we don't have primarily the time critical system whereas for example i'm going to come back with a very traditional example i always point in classes flight landing system suppose uh, you are traveling in a flight and the flight uh, has come to a state where we are going to land at our reaching terminal so in this place we are going to come through what are the various tasks that has to be executed in order to proper landing functions here let's take some examples that would be considered for the flight landing systems are the traditional one the gear has to be released over here and the next uh, we have to see that uh, all the other required parameters are met and all the passengers has wear the seat belt in order to proceed further so let's consider these are the task that has to be enabled suppose in any of these task has not been accepted and we get into the landing gear and if the landing gear is not releasing at the critical juncture of the flight landing then it's a catastrophic event that that's bound to happen so in order to prevent ourselves from this catastrophic event we go to real time operating systems where the task will meet its deadlines each of the task functions within the deadline and it is bound to happen at that certain instant irrespective of other task functioning so what we introduce here is referred as priorities basically okay so in categorically we can uh, categorize the rtos as soft rtos hard rtos and firm rtos 
what I call it as an embedded operating system, I point it out here as a firmware to OS. For example, you are working on your mobile right now and uh, assuming you are chatting with your friend through a Facebook chat application and there is a call coming in, one of your friend is trying to call you. If suppose the call that your friend trying to reach you is getting delayed by the process of enabling the call feature is getting delayed by a second or two is an acceptable feature here. We call those systems as soft real-time systems. Whereas, going back to that example, flight landing, when the flight is going to land and the gear has to be released, it has to be released at that juncture with no delay. We cannot call the delay as an acceptable parameter because it leads to a catastrophic event. We call these systems as hard real-time systems. And on top of it, soft real-time systems and firm real-time systems is differentiated by an embedded operating system running on it. Android is an embedded operating system running on mobiles. Windows is an embedded operating system. We can also refer to as firm real-time operating systems. Very essential and well-known examples is VxWorks, which is now procured by Intel, PISAS, Nucleus, RT Linux, very it's, it's even uh, taken over by NI right now and they are deploying their RT Linux features and now let's go through these structures of a real-time operating system we had seen this a uh, little while back when that what are the layers of an operating system only thing that you can differentiate primarily here is the middle layer which is indicated by uh, RTAS kernel and a BSP. BSP refers to both support packages. Okay, you can see here the custom hardware here is interacting through the BSP, which is part of the kernel, interacting with the applications. This application is written specifically for this particular kernel or this particular board. It cannot run on every systems like and generically in our windows so windows we have different applications that that can be windows have can run on arm based uh, machines windows can run on uh, intel based machines ibm based machines there are different kinds of machines available but whereas we write an Android application, we need that application to be running on that particular hardware, only that, per, only that, that particular feature is enabled to us. So which means, which indicates that we have to work with this particular features. Okay. Now let's study about the what are the various characteristics of a real-time operating system. The first thing everyone points out here is device drivers. What I called it as earlier as both support packages was also referred as device drivers. Actually, these device drivers in our generic operating system or general purpose operating system is not part of the kernel. These device drivers are provided by the vendor who manufactures that particular hardware where we work with those vendors to run these device drivers. Well, separately in today's real-time operating system these device drivers are basically part of the kernel itself which means that it is pre-packed into the kernel and you can see the primary difference between uh, a general purpose operating system which is this one and there is a specific real-time operating system which runs on a real-time kernel and we see this device driver is written part of it you see operating this device driver is part of the operating system in a general purpose operating system whereas in the real-time operating system this device drivers are specific to those particular machines which and then interacts with the middleware on the uh, on the application layers over here So the protections uh, of an embedded operating system can be working on a privileged mode of instructions which has to do with what is the IO processing that we got to do over there. 
interrupts very essential feature of an operating systems especially real time operating systems okay for example uh, suppose you are working uh, you are chatting with your friend on a facebook application and uh, right now some of your friend is trying to call you there are two tasks that we can consider in this particular situation executing also we'll introduce the third task you are watching or uh, hearing music using your headphone so primarily what is happening here is two of the tasks are running one is the facebook chat application the second one is the music application that's running parallelly both the tasks are concurrent here and right now we see a third task coming into the system which is the uh, telecalling feature which which your friend is trying to call right now okay so what is happening here is right now you're parallelly doing two applications you parallelly two applications are running on your system whereas the third feature that is coming in is trying to push these two features or applications on the background so that your application which is primarily prioritically important on a mobile phone the call feature is being enabled here so it indicates that okay these are the priorities of various task that is running in a system and categorized so which means that what is what you are hearing the music and what you are trying to chat in the phone are interrupted those tasks are interrupted there taken to some other part of memory to execute those particular task once it is finished we see again the once we your telecalling feature is done you see back your application into the system so which means when your interrupt is disabled you see whatever that's earlier running on your system is stored back okay so that's essential feature of an interrupts in an operating system going by it okay and uh, what are the real time capabilities and what are the features of a real time operating systems we can see multitasking scheduling of task with priorities as i was discussing right now synchronization of the resource access inter task communications time predictable and interrupt handling time predictable inter task communication is the main feature that i would say on a real time operating system considering the scenario to apply let's discuss this in detail characteristics of a real time operating system what we saw what are the components of an op real time operating system we just moments back saw in a layered architecture components what is referred as kernel the kernel can be monolithic or micro kernel and what is referred as device drivers or both support packages in a real time operating system so let's talk about what is this monolithic and micro kernels okay monolithic kernels are one where general purpose operating system for example windows kernel are basically monolithic kernels whereas the micro kernels are one where it's a time critical application like real time operating system features are micro kernels let's this is the structure of an or task kernel we have seen this already okay let's go to what are the requirements when can we call an operating system as a real time operating system so what what are the requirements that it has to meet let's see for example timers the timing behavior of an os must be predictable in order to so for example we don't know when our windows might be crashing due to certain background process or certain uh, results of an uh, further events that's happening in the system we might not be aware of those scenarios but whereas we should be pretty much aware what is the result of executing this particular task on this particular system how long is it going to run and when it is going to finish what are the after effects of those particular process we should be aware of all this peripheral entities in total of a execution so that's the prediction behavior that we deploy understand in a real time operating system for all the services of the operating system there is an upper bound on the execution time so which means that 
so this is the maximum time limit that it can be so it's it's restricted within this duration it has to be executing and next we call it as scheduling there might be more number of tasks executing in the real time operating system so we it indicates each of the task should gets its access time on the processor on the hardware so there has to be a scheduling algorithm which is very deterministic in feature in order to each of the task gets its execution duration to run next the period during which the interrupts are disabled must be short which means that unpredictable delays in processing the critical events should not be affected also the os should manage the timing and scheduling so the kernel should basically manage the scheduling algorithm here not the algorithm not the scheduler decides that the kernel has to be the scheduler here to take a call which task should run based on the priorities based on the requirements of the real time operating system of course we went through this thing what are the functions provided by the general purpose operating system in in a nutshell now the same is provided by real time operating system as resource management the process management the memory management the timer management all these are provided as a resource management by the operating system over here the task management feature also is a separate process the inter task communication like what we can call it as semaphore mutex mails mailboxes all these features are referred as inter task communication which means one of the task is trying to get a hold over the next task into the system it it wants to understand what is the particular register trying to do i want the particular data for my own execution purposes okay so let's let's uh, understand why should we go for a uh, real time why should we go for a real time operating system because can use drivers that are available with an real time operating system okay can focus on developing application code not on creating or maintaining a scheduling system okay now the essential feature multi thread support with synchronization which means that as i was pointing out in the earlier slide different kinds of support has to be enabled by different task in order to intercommunicate within itself so multi thread is an essential feature considered here resource handling by the real time operating system so the kernel has to understand basically the micro kernel here has to understand what are the available resources and what can it do and the decisions has to be taken which has to be predictable deterministic add new features without affecting the higher priority functions so basically all of the supports are should be provided by the upper layer protocols uh, the network let it be the can protocol the snmp all this has to be part of it even the file systems okay so we went through this the classification of real time operating systems uh, what are the kernels available what are the rt rt is an real time feature it's an extension provided to the basic uh, kernel okay so this is one such uh, thing what, what is provided by a uh, rt linux what are the various tasks provided and how with each of the task is trying to interact let's see so these are the applications mozilla is an application here and bash is the shell layer and in it is one of the uh, application that's running over there it is part of the scheduler which is actually interacting with the kernel okay. scheduler is one thing part of the kernel itself so the kernel ha has to run this on the hardware so which means that this is the both support package here the drivers over here so the linux kernel will have to get inputs from these three tasks takes decision and loads it to the hardware suppose there is an interrupt 
So this is the Linux kernel version, whereas this one is the RT Linux kernel version. So RT Linux has this functionality of interrupts capabilities. So it takes decision of when, I, when it has to provide interrupts on what scenarios it has to take those decisions. You see each of the tasks that's created is a real time task, whereas here these are not real time tasks over here. So each of the task executed here is managed by the RT scheduler itself. It takes decision. You can see very well here the interrupts for the real time tasks has to be directly with the hardware level understanding the RT scheduler's features. What is an RTAS kernel about? A task is a basic, basic unit of an execution in a real time marketing system. The RTAS scheduler needs to be deterministic, right? If it's zero, it has to be. It has to be so, or if it has to be execution state, it has to be. We discussed this. Scheduling policies that are available in an operating system, real time operating systems are clock driven, priority driven. So, that the scheduling is basically categorically what are the tasks that it can execute and what are the scheduler events that it can run in this particular scenario. So, the decision is taken by the scheduler here. So, this particular scheduler can be either based on the clock pulses produced by the processor or the oscillator over there externally or based on the priorities of the tasks available. So, when we consider what are the various priority driven task uh, scheduling algorithms, uh, we uh, people globally consider this uh, rate monotonic scheduling algorithm and the earliest deadline first scheduling algorithm. So, what if there is a non preemptive kernel running in the system? Let's analyze this particular feature. Here, what we see here is task, the low priority task and the high priority task and how interrupts is being servicing the ISR, interrupt service routine is taking a decision to provide what has to be happening when a high priority task is interrupting the system. So you see the stage one low priority task, the task is right now executing into the in the kernel and we see the second stage where an interrupt is popping up right now interrupt service routine for example we call this as okay this interrupt service routine makes the high priority task ready okay and what happens is goes to the third stage and goes back again to indicate that okay uh, i wanted to provide the services to the high priority task right now and next the low priority task is relinquishing the CPU and giving up the uh, access the resource to the high priority task. So now high priority task takes the precedence and it starts executing. So that non preemption feature preemptive this is not going to give up preemptive okay whereas we are making this at a non preemptive kernel okay so you see the time taken in giving up this particular so this is one such factor that might affect the performance of a real time operating system let's see what a preemptive kernel is about so you see here the low priority task request for a interrupt service routine and now you see the high priority task gaining the function over here. It finishes its execution and gives up. And now again the non low priority task comes to execute. So whereas in the earlier slide we saw that non preemptive kernel is not giving up. The low priority task is not giving up. Whereas in a preemptive kernel where we can preempt the task from the functioning layer so as to enable the high priority task that it can go and execute its particular uh, priority level based on the priorities 
As I was pointing out when you are working in a Facebook application and you see some of your friend is trying to call, essentially you see that your friend calling feature pops up rather than Facebook is trying to prevent, no, 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 no. I am right now you are chatting, do not make your friend to call. So it doesn't happen so because the primary feature of a mobile is supposed to call. So someone calls, you get that as a top priority. So that's the primary difference between a non preemptive kernel and a preemptive kernel over here. And what is this multitasking over here? What are the various states or tasks available? We see that P indicates uh, the task is in the queue, pending state. And R stands for ready. The S stands for suspension and the D stands for delay. So this we call it as TCB, task control block. So this particular task control block feature is a part of the scheduler to take decisions. This particular task has to do this particular executing scenario at this particular stage. So this is how a multitasking is trying to bring all the tasks that is running in the system to be given its own share of execution space in the processor. That's one good point of the multitasking feature. Of course, the multi-threading also plays a major role here. Okay, let's see what is the suspended task. I mean, first, let's the ready is the task that is available in the ready queue as if it is indicating I'm ready to be executed. Can you give me the kernel? Uh, uh, I mean the scheduler can you give me some time for me to execute in the system so and then when the system gives its uh, space to execute and uh, some of the events might be running in the task and there might be a waiting uh, I mean suppose the task is waiting for one of the register to calculate its result and that register is uh, right now is in a wait state so we take this particular task to the pending state because it is pending for an event to happen. The register A has to populate its information so which means that till the register A is read, has populated it, it cannot execute. So which means the task is which is there in the ready execution stage comes to the suspension stage. From the suspension state, it can either go to the pending state due to a scenario or it can go back to the ready state. So, so that's it can communicate both ways. Also, it can go to a delay state because the register A is in some other uh, events, some other uh, processor uh, or a task has taken up. So, which means it has to wait for a uh, period of a time. And then next, what is a real time task about? It has to be periodic. So each task is repeated at regular intervals of time. The maximum execution time might be same, might be different depending on the scheduler that we are going to schedule over here. Arrival time is usually at the start of the period, each of the tasks. We, we are going to see this thing. Deadline is usually at the end. What if, if it's an aperiodic task? It indicates primarily that it can come at any point of a time and it can leave at any point of a time. Multitask and an intertask communications it's going to happen. Okay, we, we see that as if, for example, uh, when we, when you switch on your laptop and you start browsing and you put a movie on the back end and you see some uh, some other applications also running as if every events are happening concurrently but in reality it is not the scenario it is actually what you see here what you see here is task 1 executing its own share of period gives up the CPU task 2 gets its own share of period gives up the CPU task 3 has to happen its own period of execution again gives back to task 1. So which means that on a periodic or a periodic durations each of the tasks are running its own period of a time and it is multiplexing within itself. 
the CPU duration to execute its whole share of period. So this is what this particular inter-task communication and the multitasking is indicated. Next. One other feature of an operating system is context switching. So here context switching you can see suppose there is a CPU and you have a step pointer and program counter and some, some other registers which has some primary information about uh, the executing and we have a program memory and a data memory separately located and uh, right now the stack pointer is at zero to, uh, let's let's point out it, it is pointing to the zero and the program memory here it, it is going to execute three instructions right away the first instruction is ldi register one zero fa the next it has to execute load register two with the value zero e2 and the next we have to add these two values so the primary function of this particular program is to load the fa value into the register one load the e2 value into the register two and then execute the addition operation so what happens is the instructions has to store the value in order to really go to the execution stage without this two execution stage we cannot go to the, the previous instructions have already set the registers used by the add when the task is received the add instructions will be the first instruction to execute the task will not know if a different task has modified suppose an interrupt has popped up right now what would have happened or a suspension has happened is so it is understood the load we, when we have an arm kind of an architecture where, where it basically works on a load store architecture the load store takes care of getting the data into the memory and pulling the data back to the memory here we understood that okay the addition operation is the first instruction that's going to be executed understanding that the load has finished its share of work there but if it is not there we are stuck and then next let's uh, discuss this uh, interrupt service code later scheduling okay that's that's one important thing that we have to see a scheduler that's where the kernel really talks about it decides primarily when we have a preemptive scheduling we consider maximum of 255 tasks executing in the system starting from the priority level of 0 to the priority level of 25 here 0 is considered the higher primarily mostly 0 is considered the higher priority task and 255 is considered as the lower priority task so each of the priority has its own queue functioning into the system if two tasks are in ready state lower priority task would be preempted always by the higher priority task okay let us go through the very basic scheduling referred as round robin scheduling algorithm what happens here really is that there are four tasks executing into the system task a b c d always what happens is a executes first b next c next d next again a so which means a b c d keeps rounding and rounding here preemption locks these locks prevent task context switching but do not prevent interrupt handling see context switching is one is not taken care by this particular sorry it's it's prevented by the preemption lock but whereas the interrupt handling is not because interrupt is one important feature of an operating system that has that shouldn't be taken care by the scheduler itself it has to be part of the kernel itself kernel controls the scheduler of course here you see that what happens to different uh, scenarios when task 1, task 2, task 3 are executing, task 1 ready, task 2 gets, gives up the CPU and task, sorry, third stage, task 3 is ready to execute and interrupt happens over there. So different, at different time slices, different tasks are running in the system here. 
real time scheduling can basically be a dynamic in feature or a static in feature which means that the events that are happening in the system can be a dynamic or a static the scheduler can be dynamic or static so let's take the classical example of a static schedulers i call it as rate monotonic scheduling algorithm okay so the tasks are a periodic sorry periodic here with hard deadlines tasks are completely independent and do not communicate with each other tasks are scheduled according to the priorities and the priorities is fixed that's what we call it as a static scheduling algorithm computation time is not a priori before we execute and it's going to be constant also this rate monotonic refers to assigning priorities at monotonic function functioning rate also simply referred as rms scheduling algorithm here okay this R rate monotonic scheduling algorithm is static on any hard real time system concept to decide if its systems is schedulable okay let's let's see this example here so we see here there are three tasks running in the system and each of the task is going to take 4 millisecond 5 millisecond 6 millisecond and the deadline of first task one for example it will execute for 4 millisecond before the deadline of 10 millisecond task 2 will execute 5 millisecond before the deadline of 15 millisecond and task 3 will run for 6 millisecond before the deadline of 25 millisecond also we call it as the rate at which this is going to happen for every 10 millisecond this is going to run for 4 millisecond task 1 for every 15 millisecond task 2 is going to run for 5 millisecond every 25 millisecond we see task 3 is going to run for 6 milliseconds and the priorities are fixed at based on the deadlines shorter the deadline higher the priority so this indicates i'm giving 3 2 1 for the tasks task 1 task 2 task 3 and the utilization is calculated by the factor of 4 plus 5 plus 6 in total divided for 15 in total it is taking 15 millisecond 4 millisecond out of 15 millisecond the utilization period is 40% whereas the task 2 the utilization period is 33% whereas 6 millisecond the utilization period is i'm sorry i'm sorry i can just the execution time is calculated by dividing the execution time from the deadline that it has to execute so every 10 millisecond it has to execute only 4 millisecond that gets you 40 percent of utilization period so you can calculate in total what is the total execution period over here 4 divided by 10 plus 5 divided by 15 plus 6 divided by 25 which equals 0.94 which is lesser than 100 this is an essential feature to schedule any kind of a task suppose any of the task you see it is going beyond 1 it's not schedulable it 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 will lead to a catastrophic event at some point of a time so any task can be computed for its cpa cpu utilization period for this particular duration it's it's computed at prime so now let's see task 1 indicated by hash 1 task 2 indicated by hash 2 task 3 indicated by hash 3 so since 3 is the higher priority task it gets first into the system runs for 4 millisecond right okay it's done next you see the second task is trying to run for 10 5 millisecond so 4 plus 5 9 millisecond done and now task 3 will come into execution and it runs for 9th to 10th millisecond but there is a deadline by task 1 that it has to meet every 10 millisecond 
because it has to run every 10 millisecond for 4 millisecond okay now task 1 has taken the situation right away here and now what happens is it goes running for 4 millisecond so which means that this 3 task 3 can run only for 1 millisecond and goes to the wait queue it, it waits for its turn of execution space so once this task 1 finishes 4 millisecond execution now task 3 comes to execute and what happens is task 3 runs for 14th to 15 again you see task 2 is waiting for 15 millisecond ok now it has to run for another 5 millisecond it has already finished its own thing next before the 15th millisecond next to the 15th millisecond it has to execute it can it gets its own share right so okay it runs for task 2 runs for another 5 millisecond done ok once it has finished now we see task 1 gets its deadline so which means that it has to execute for another 4 millisecond so 22 24 it starts running again 24 to 25 task 1 starts task 3 runs for 1 millisecond now you see that at the 25 millisecond this has this should have run for 6 millisecond whereas which has not happened so task of this nature will fail it is not that every instance rate monotonic is going to fail no but on this particular scenario it will fail so we have to compute a prior whether there is a failure there is a catastrophic event bound to happen so this prediction is very essential in order to decide which kind of scheduler to be deployed for this particular tasks so what are the properties of red monotonic scheduling algorithm no resource sharing as we discussed as a constraint deterministic deadlines are exactly equal to the periods of execution context switching times are free and have no impact on the model so this is one essential feature of any kind of a real time operating system also once the priorities of a task is assigned they will remain constant for the lifetime of the task which means that when you fix the priorities over here 3 2 1 it is going to be constant that is why it is called as a static scheduler so of course there are some limitations so you can calculate a worst case schedulable bound period you using the factor utilization factor over here using this formula the ca by ta summation of ta by ca by ta for the period 1 to n okay so this gives you is there any worst case scheduler bound to happen over there in general any kind of red monotonic scheduling algorithm can meet all deadline if CPA utilization is 70% actually it's 0.69% in reality okay. if any kind of CPA utilization factor which is calculated by the formula of 4 divided by 10 plus 5 divided by 15 plus 6 divided by 20 which equals to the factor of 0.94 in this particular example has to be lesser than 0.69 so if it is satisfied then we understand that we can deploy rate monotonic scheduling algorithm in an effective manner the other 30 percent generally is taken by the lower priority task for non real time up task computations the context switching is very high although although the CPU utilization is not perfect ok let's go to the next uh, dynamic scheduling algorithm over here earliest deadline first also referred as EDF ok assume a preventive preemptive system is with dynamic priorities is going to be deployed over here let's take the same example scenario uh, no of course uh, same example 
task 1, task 2, task 3, with its own execution period of 4 milliseconds, 4 milliseconds, and 5 milliseconds, with the, the same deadlines. And of course, the utilization factor is varied over here due to the changes in 6 and 5 in the execution time, considering the earlier example and how this scenario is deployed. See, here the deadlines are calculated at runtime. That is why in the bar chart you see there is no deadline given over here. It is computed at runtime. Okay, let's schedule this thing. So, the deadline is provided here based on the execution requirement. Task 1 runs for 4 milliseconds. It has to run for every 10 millisecond, of course. And now you see task 2 coming to execution state and it runs for again 4 millisecond. Of course, it has to run only at the 15th millisecond, after the 15th millisecond then. Task 3 runs for 2 milliseconds. So, which means it has to run another 3 milliseconds right now. And you see the task 1 needs to execute another 10 millisecond here. What happens in reality here is that task 1 can run within the 10 millisecond at any point of a time. So it has already run one particular duration of 4 millisecond. So, before the 10th to 20th duration, task 1 has to execute another 10 milliseconds. So, it can wait for some point of a time here and task 3 can go on executing. It will complete its duration of 5 milliseconds in total. So, once it is finished, it can give up the execution time for task 2 over or task 3 here. What is referred as shared code and re-entrancy is a single copy of code that is executed by multiple tasks. For example, threads is one important feature here. So, it might be concern of the registers, but the same segment of code is executed by different of the tasks to do. For example, a copy operation for suppose. We can refer this as shared code. And shard code must be re-entrant because a subroutine is re-entrant if a single copy of the routine can be called simultaneously from several task contacts without conflicts, of course. So, what are the ways that we can execute this re-entry techniques are dynamic stack variables, global and static variables, and task variables. Okay. So, this here deplicating one such structure how this dynamic stack variables are deployed by different tasks two different tasks of course here by two different task stacks operating on a common function okay so communication function of our data is one such function that's deployed by task one for this same task stack and different task two for the same task stacks of data two. Okay. This has to be guarded global and static variables. Mutual exclusion mechanism only one task at a time can be in critical section of the code. This is one essential feature of any kind of an operating system. What is referred as mutual exclusion is that it can give up its execution time but there can be only one such task at a time which can be in a critical section of execution. Critical section here indicates that if a task has started executing before completion of its particular duration it shouldn't be given up the processor duration which means that it has to be non preemptive in that particular scenario it has to be non preemptive irrespective or else it leads to a failure task variables four byte variables are added to the task control block here yeah. okay 
so its features are discussed over here inter task communication main feature of any kind of an operating system or real time operating system what are the various inter task communication features that it is trying to provide okay and uh, how can it share the data how can it share the information using message queue pipes it's a virtual input output elements and there is network inter task communications using sockets remote processor call actually inter task communication you can you can see the memory it is trying to share the data between different tasks over here task 1 task 2 task 3 is sharing same memory data but of course with the different tasks over here so you do get it so different task is trying to access the same memory over here and it does its own computation using that particular task and takes result of it so in this case what happens if task 1 is trying to take hold of the shared data from the memory and as if it is trying to block task 2 and task 3 to execute or changes the computed value no it shouldn't be the case right so here is where semaphore comes into play okay so semaphore the traditional example that everyone can point out is a railway track with a flag indicating which train can pass right now and which train has to stop in the track right now in order to that it cannot collide on the both sides so semaphore is one such signal here which is signaling the operating system that this task is ready to execute and this task has to hold on for certain period of a time for example task is getting to execute right now you see semaphore available no it's it's still waiting you see there is a time time out period if it's waiting for beyond a period of a time semaphores are bound to fail but if it is succeeded okay it has it proceeds to execution okay there are actually various semaphores of which we binary semaphores is one primarily deployed also referred as mutex counting semaphores where it can count up or down okay message queue allows a variable number of messages to be queued there is a function that it has to pass an information to the other function you can use message queues mailbox as a point over here any task or interrupt service routine can send a message to a queue basically real time synchronization is about how each of the inter task communication is deployed with the feature of real time synchronization feature potentially the thing has to be considered here is priority inversion and chain blocking what is priority inversion here suppose a low priority task is executing right now in the system and there is a higher priority task than it and medium priority task and a higher priority task and a medium priority task which is actually taking control of the system wants the execution whereas a high priority task is there so that this priority inversion takes care of so that it can avoid this medium priority task taking control for example let's consider a scenario suppose i see task l as a camera task over here and task m as a facebook application task here and i see task h as a calling feature task in your android or iphones suppose task h which is basically as per the mobile phone feature the primary higher priority task whereas the camera taking is a low priority task facebook chat is a medium priority task considering these scenarios you are taking a camera picture right now and the picture has been captured in the buffer but whereas not in the memory card right now it has to be stored because you are working with a high 
uh, HD camera possibly so which means it is not completed suppose a call comes up right now you have to put the calling feature on the back back end side suppose there is a Facebook application coming into it right now so the calling feature will inverse itself with the camera feature that as if the camera feature is the higher priority task so this Facebook application has to go for a waiting period memory is taken care by the memory management unit also the memory protection unit of course there are two memory levels one is the user space one is the kernel space executing okay. there is of course the virtual space concept which we will see in the next possible classes and our task kernel is basically executed by the timer timer is the software entity has the total control because this is one which produces the clock pulses and instructs the R task it has to execute at this this task has to execute at this period of a time watchdog timers programmable timers also lend a support over here we have discussed a lot about the IPC expectations from R task of course the deadline has to be met so that's why it is indicated as a deadline driven operating system work with dearth of resources intricate IO interfaces for example in our mobile phones today we have touch panels with the different sensitivity levels push buttons there has to be a fail safe scenario what happens if your mobile Android crashes is there a fail safe boot available of course it has to be robust availability and different junctions what are the various applications we see flight simulators pointing out as the first primary thing radio and optical telescopes navigational systems deep stream instrumentations lot lot printer instruments. real-time applications we have seen a lot okay so this I believe is end of the introduction to what is basically a real-time operating system and I've given you a fair idea I'm welcome for your feedbacks on this channel thank you